Dear listeners, welcome all of you who are interested in electroencephalography and event-related potentials techniques, and all of you who are interested in collecting, annotating, standardizing, storing, processing, sharing, and publishing data from electrical activity of the human brain. Welcome to the video tutorial that has a goal to provide you with the description of what everything can happen to electroencephalography and event-related potential data during their whole life cycle, from their collection to their final long-term preservation and publication. The tutorial is intended primarily for beginners, but it will also be beneficial to experimentalists who understand electroencephalography and event-related techniques but need additional knowledge in annotation, standardization, long-term storage, and publication of data. Since electroencephalography and event-related potentials are words that are rather long and difficult to pronounce, we will mainly use a short term for electroencephalography, EEG, and also a short term for event-related potentials, ERP. At the very beginning, we have to say that this tutorial has been created to be data-centric. It means that we will talk much more about how EEG and ERP data are collected, annotated, standardized, stored, managed, shared and finally published, than how the related EEG and ERP experiments are designed and what is their scientific value, impact and benefit. Moreover, we would like not only to guide you through the complete life cycle of EEG and ERP data obtained from human subjects, but in parallel, we would like to emphasize a broader idea of open and fair scientific data and present the need for active work of standardization initiatives, benefits of long-term EEG and ERP data sustainability, and existence of data standards in the domain. The tutorial does generally want to help change a common view of the importance of data sustainability in neuroscience and increase both the efficiency and effectiveness of research in the field. This video tutorial consists of six parts that are between 20 and 40 minutes long. They can be studied separately, since some important pieces of information are repeated. Despite this fact, if you are not familiar with the EEG and ERP techniques, or if you are very new in the EEG and ERP data processing, we recommend to follow individual parts of the tutorial as they naturally succeed. It helps you better understand the core and inputs and outputs of each part, and also the life cycle as a whole. The tutorial covers a description of the EEG and ERP technique, EEG and ERP data and metadata characteristics, design of EEG and ERP scientific project, hardware and software infrastructure for data collection, legal issues related to data and metadata collection, storage and use, standards and tools for data and metadata annotation, storage, sharing and publication, and methods for data preprocessing and processing. Each part of the tutorial includes a general initial description of the topic followed by a specific examples given on the data obtained from a real brain-computer interface BCI project. At the end of each part, a short quiz is given to you. Six parts of the tutorial cover the following topics related to EEG and ERP data lifecycle. The first part brings a brief description of the techniques of EEG and ERP characteristics of EEG data and metadata, description of the whole data lifecycle and emphasize the idea of open and fair data. It also serves as a basic overview of the next parts of the tutorial. The second part of the tutorial deals with the description and design of EEG and ERP scientific project and introduces a hardware and software infrastructure for collection of EEG and ERP data. The third part deals with data security and legislation related to data and metadata collection and their subsequent storage and use, and the fourth part then deals with the procedure of data and metadata collection itself. In the fifth part, possibilities and approaches to EEG data and metadata annotation, storage, sharing and publication are presented. It also includes existing standards, standardization initiatives and developed tools. Data and metadata preprocessing and processing, the used methods, workflows and tools are described in the sixth part. Let's now concentrate on the first part of our tutorial. 
At first, we shortly introduced the methods and techniques of EEG and ERP. Then we will already focus on data. We will gradually explain why it is important to take care of data, what is the difference between data and metadata, and what fair principles for data management mean. After that, we shortly introduced the Neuroinformatics Research Group at the University of West Bohemia that has prepared this tutorial and will continue with the core of our tutorial, EEG and ERP data lifecycle. Individual parts of this lifecycle will be shortly presented as an invitation to the next parts of the tutorial. This part is concluded with the introductory presentation of the brain-computer interface, BCI, Project Basil and a short quiz. EEG is a method and technique to measure and record electrical activity of the brain that comes from a large number of different neural sources. In our case, we will take into account only non-invasive EEG that uses the electrodes placed along the human scalp, although invasive electrodes are also used. Continuous EEG is a very coarse measure of the brain's spontaneous electrical activity over a period of time and investigates neural oscillations that can be observed in the EEG signal in the time domain or more often in the frequency domain. However, it is generally difficult to isolate individual neurocognitive processes and responses directly from the EEG signal. These specific neural responses, called ERPs, that are associated with specific sensory, cognitive and motor events or stimuli can be extracted from the EEG signal by a simple averaging technique. It means that event-related potential, also called an evoked potential, represents time-locked voltage fluctuation to an event-like visual or auditory stimulus or button press. P3 or P300 component is the most known and well-described ERP component that is elicited in the process of decision-making and thus widely used in BCI systems. EEG and ERP techniques have an excellent temporal resolution, one millisecond or better under optimal conditions. But their spatial resolution is in fact undefined because there are many internal neural configurations that can explain a given pattern of data. Possibility to conduct non-invasive measurements and relatively low costs when comparing to imaging techniques are advantages of these techniques. Comparing to behavioral techniques, ERP technique provides a continuous measure of processing between a stimulus and a response, and thus it is possible to determine which stage or stages of processing are affected by a specific experimental manipulation. Moreover, it can provide an online measure of the processing of stimuli even when there is no behavioral response. On the other hand, the functional significance of an ERP is never as clear as the functional significance of a behavioral response. What is important for our tutorial? Most techniques need a hardware and software infrastructure to collect, store, annotate, share and publish large amounts of EEG and ERP data and metadata that come from experimental or even clinical measurements. The inevitable goal of science is to bring new knowledge and thus increase overall knowledge of humankind. Any data that are collected, stored and even maintained do not carry this scientific value by themselves but have to be analyzed, interpreted and published to bring new knowledge in the world of science. It means that EEG data are a substrate for the next stage of scientific work. For experimentalists, the design of the EEG of or ERP experiment has to be innovative and the result of interpretation of data has to come with something new. Or, for more technically oriented scientists, Used analytic methods or the whole workflows have to be innovative and come with better results than the others have achieved, at least on some datasets. This world is not too kind to the efforts and initiatives that advocate for well and standardized annotation of scientific data, their proper storage and long-term maintenance. In the EEG domain, this situation is even more crucial. There has not been introduced a widely accepted and used standard for storing and annotating EEG data yet although there exists various data formats and promising standardization initiatives. Moreover, a proper annotation of EEG data is a time-consuming task that might not be seen by scientists as beneficial because is there anybody who will be interested in well-annotated data when their interpretation has been published? 
Apart from this, some researchers consider this approach of annotating, sharing and even publishing raw and uninterpreted data as potentially dangerous, since there might be some other researchers who can interpret their data first and get the scientific credit for it. Despite these fears and difficulties, it is reasonable and beneficial to standardize, annotate, share and publish both raw and interpreted EEG data. Also, the experimental work is very time-consuming and costs for repeated experiments are enormous. Moreover, we have to admit that data analysis might not have been done correctly just by mistake. We can also come with better analytic methods and higher computational power in the future. So, in the long term, well-annotated, standardized and shared scientific data would increase both the effectiveness and efficiency of research. However, this change of perspective probably cannot come from individual scientists. It is a systematic change that has to be driven by governments, funding agencies and publishers. Luckily, the situation has started to change. We will thus consider EEG and ERP data as basic elements that are in the center of research in the domain and that are worth preserving. It means they should be properly collected, annotated, stored, shared, interpreted and published. In the previous slide, we have come to the result that EEG data are valuable. However, raw EEG data that lack any other additional information can hardly have any scientific or pragmatic value in the long term. The reason is simple. If we do not know or remember all important conditions or circumstances under which a recording was done or an experiment performed, we cannot make any reasonable analysis or interpretation of such data in the future. It means that to maintain the value of raw data in the long term, in other words, to ensure their sustainability, we need to add and store additional information about data together with them. All important pieces of information we know about experimental design, data collection process, tested subjects and so on, which are worth identifying and storing for future use, are called metadata. Metadata are in fact data about data. Of course, Sometimes it's hard to say what data and metadata are. The border between them is not always clear. The common definition of data and metadata says that data can simply be a piece of information, a list of measurements or observations, a story or a description of a certain thing, while metadata specify the relevant information about the data which helps in identifying the nature and feature of the data. In our case, we will consider recording channels data arrays representing voltage fluctuations in time and segments or events representing basic tagging of the EEG signal as the data and all other information including the sampling frequency, characteristics of tested subjects or use devices as metadata. It's reasonable to organize metadata in various categories and standardize them using terminologies or even ontologies. This is discussed in more detail in part 5. In 2016, the FAIR Guiding Principles for Scientific Data Management and Stewardship were published in the journal Scientific Data, based on a set of 15 guiding principles to make data so-called findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable, a set of metrics has been defined to quantify levels of fairness. These guiding prin principles emphasize machine actionability because humans highly rely on computational support to deal with data. This is, of course, a result of the increase in volume, complexity and creation speed of data. The latest developments on FAIR data are available at GoFAIR webpage. However, let us briefly introduce the basic principles. The first principle says that data should be findable. It means that both data and metadata are easy to find for both humans and computers. Machine-readable metadata are important for automatic discovery of datasets and services, so this is an essential component of the verification process. It practically means the data together with metadata are assigned a globally unique and persistent identifier. Data are described with rich metadata. Metadata clearly and explicitly include the identifier of the data they describe. And data together with metadata are registered or indexed in a searchable resource. The next principle, the data are accessible, means that when the user finds the required data, 
She or he needs to know how these data can be accessed, including authentication and authorization. It practically means that data and metadata are retrievable by their identifier using a standardized communication protocol, and this protocol is open, free, universally implementable, and allows for an authentication and authorization procedure where necessary. Moreover, metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. The next guiding principle focuses on data and metadata interoperability, and it is reckoned with the fact that data usually need to be integrated with other data. In addition, the data need to interoperate with applications or workflows for their analysis, storage and processing. This principle includes the following requirements. Data and metadata use a formal, accessible, shared and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. They use vocabularies that follow fair principles and include qualified references to other data and metadata. The ultimate goal of fair principles is to optimize data reuse. To achieve this, metadata and data have to be well described so that they can be replicated and or combined in different settings. It means that data and metadata are richly described with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. They are released with a clear and accessible data usage license. They are associated with detailed provenance and meet domain-relevant community standards. While we have mainly talked about data and metadata so far, these principles refer to three types of entities – data, metadata and infrastructure. For instance, Registering and indexing data and metadata has to be done in a searchable resource that is an infrastructure component. Now we know that not only data but also metadata and infrastructure are important for long-term management of FAIR EEG data. Before we get to the core of this tutorial, EEG data lifecycle, we shortly introduce a neuroinformatics group at the University of West Bohemia in the Czech Republic. From the previous slides, we already know or can guess that operation of electrophysiological laboratory, design and performance of electrophysiological experiments, collection, storage, management and sharing of experimental data and metadata, analysis and interpretation of these data, metadata, and final publication of results are time-consuming activities. These activities need to be well organized and supported by a suitable infrastructure to increase work efficiency and effectiveness of researchers. The Neuroinformatics Group at the University of West Bohemia focuses on research of brain electrical activity using the methods and techniques of EEG and ERP. Except for experimental work, mostly carried out on humans, our group develops, integrates and maintains a software and hardware infrastructure for electrophysiology research. Apart from commercial devices, this infrastructure includes, for example, a repository for managing experimental data and metadata, called EEG Base, library of methods and workflows for EEG and ERP signal data processing, software tool for stimuli generation offering visual programming, software tool for one-click control of both stimulation and recording software, and hardware devices such as EEG caps or headbands, that use various approaches how to organize recording electrodes and capture the EEG signal. Active box for collecting and transmitting signals from various sensors and visual and audio stimulator for cognitive research. Experimental work of the group is usually performed together with the experts from the University Hospital in Pilsen. The last project Basil will be introduced at the end of this part. Now we have come to the main point of this part of our tutorial. Every research project that is aiming to collect and store data, test hypotheses and share or publish collect data should use techniques to ensure that the data are collected, managed, stored and shared properly. It requires a series of follow-up and interrelated steps that are depicted in the presented figure as a data lifecycle for EEG and ERP data. Please note that this is an example of a possible data lifecycle for such data. Yours can be subject to change. The individual steps shown in the picture simultaneously define the next parts of our tutorial. As the very first step in our data lifecycle is planning phase. The main focus on the planning phase 
is to establish an experimental design and plan on why, what, when, where, who, and how to collect, store, manage, and share the data throughout their life cycle. For example, how and in what formats the data will be stored. To do that, we have been developing a hardware and software infrastructure that was shortly presented at the last slide. If the experimental design is in line with legislation, the experiment is approved by an ethics committee. During a data collection phase, the whole hardware and software infrastructure, including recording and stimulation devices and software tools, is finalized and EEG and ERP data are recorded according to the experimental design. It's common that the first experiment revealed that some changes have to be done in the experimental design, but these changes do not usually violate conditions under which the experiment was approved. Sometimes other physiological data can be captured together with EEG and ERP data. All captured data are converted to their digital form. In a data description phase, these data are annotated by metadata in a standardized and structured form, then stored and eventually shared. In an analysis phase, the data and metadata can be evaluated using various pre-processing and processing methods. The quality of the data needs to be additionally assured by using visual inspection or automatic procedures. This is also known as cleaning the data by removing errors or invalid values from measurements. The last, but not least, is a publication phase. During this phase, the data are securely stored inside a public repository fulfilling requirements of the related journal in which the data are further described. On the following slides, we will look at each life cycle phase a little bit closer to provide you with the content of the next parts of our video tutorial. Now, we shortly explain the first, planning phase, and part of the second, experiment design phase. Both these phases are described in part two of the tutorial. Data security and legislation that have to be also taken into account during the experimental design phase will be described later in the third part. The main focus on the planning phase is to establish a plan on why, what, when, where, who and how to collect, store, annotate, manage and share the data throughout their life cycle. This phase, of course, overlaps to some extent with the experiment design phase that results in some experiment prototype. Our hardware and software infrastructure for research in electrophysiology is built independently of specific EEG or ERP experiments. In the planning phase, thus we have to decide not only what are the scientific goals of the experiment or where the experiment will take place, but also what hardware and software infrastructure will be used for collecting, storing and managing data, or which data formats and metadata terminologies are suitable for data description. During the planning and experimental design phases, we should at least have a general idea on how to orchestrate the experiment as a whole while evaluating possible time, location and experimental constraints. In the experiment design phase, we have to design the experiment itself and harmonize it with all related laws and regulations. Designing an experiment means to transform scientific goals to description of a real experimental procedure, decide which methods and techniques are suitable to use. In our case, we focus on continuous EEG and ERP techniques. To respect overall advantages, disadvantages, principles, rules, strategies and best practices of each technique and finally define and develop an experimental protocol, usually in the form of experiment prototype. To do it, various software tools can be used to create and later run the experiment. This experiment prototype, together with the overall project plan resulting from the planning phase, must be approved by the ethics committee. To take into account ethical issues and legislation related to data security and protection is an important step not only during the experiment design phase. When performing EEG and ERP experiments, we collect personal and sensitive data and metadata that are necessary for the successful interpretation of the experiment and its results. Since collection, storage and management of such data and metadata is potentially dangerous, we have to deal with their security and restricted access to them. 
The term security can be defined as the way we treat and share data without them being corrupted, stolen, misused, or lost in the process. In the third part of our tutorial, we will focus on security of data collected during EEG experiments, ethical issues applied to any data processing stage, and legislation that affect the way we treat personal and sensitive information included in the data. In this part, we will also show a short example on how to refine the collected data to be more secured according to the regulations of the European Union. The first part of our tutorial deals with the procedure of EEG and ERP data collection. The procedure itself has to start with the preparation and provision of detailed information to the participant and initial settings of the hardware and software infrastructure for data collection. Prior to any measurement, each participant is familiarized with the goal of the experiment, overall experimental procedure and related legal conditions. Then, if they agree, they sign the informed consent. Then the participant is asked to provide experimenter with a set of metadata about himself or herself as they were defined during the experiment design. Then the experiment itself is performed. The recording infrastructure commonly includes EEG electrodes to capture the EEG signal from participant's head, amplifier, recording software and hardware device or software tool used for generating stimuli. This all has to be interconnected to precisely synchronize stimuli with the recorded EEG signal. The data collection procedure itself includes placing EEG electrodes on the participant's head, attaching any possible additional sensors, checking the impedance of the electrodes, visual inspection of the recorded data, and reactions of the participant to stimulation that is done by the experimenter and possible corrections and experiment repetitions in case of any difficulties. Usually a short evaluation of the experiment given by the participant is required at the end of the experimental procedure. The long-term value of collected EEG and ERP data does not depend only on their current scientific value, but also on the way the data are annotated, stored, shared and eventually published. That is why the fifth part of the tutorial focuses on proper annotation of data using metadata and introduces existing standardization initiatives and efforts for organizing, storing and sharing EEG and ERP data. However, not only initiatives and efforts are presented, also approaches and specific conceptual and technical solutions related to storing and sharing of EEG and ERP data are described. Even the final data publication is not forgotten and this part is concluded with the real examples of data publications. The main goal of the sixth part of the tutorial is to introduce the procedure of extracting desired information from the obtained EEG signal. It is of course assumed that we have already designed and performed an EEG or EIP experiment and our data have been properly stored and annotated and may be shared and published to allow their reusability and interpretation. Now it's time to analyze the data. It's usually not an easy task, because EEG data are often noisy and have to be first pre-processed. However, the results can be worth it. For example, it is possible to discover how the human brain responds to stimuli. In this part, motivation for EEG signal processing is given, and then different categories of methods and software tools for data processing are introduced. After that, the practical usage of methods is demonstrated in EEG lab on an example of the P300 ERP dataset. As the next step, the usage of methods is demonstrated on the BCI projects. As we already mentioned in the beginning of this tutorial, we will provide examples on the data obtained from the real BCI project called Basil. Now it is the right time to introduce this Czech Bavarian project. The goal of this BCI system, the brain-driven computer assistance system for people with limited mobility, is to provide communication and control pathways to people with severe motor disabilities. Non-invasive BCIs focus primarily on EEG and ERP-based methods. It means that they use scalp-recorded electrical activity of the human brain to control an application or environment. Over the past years, BCI research has increased dramatically. 
The techniques and workflows focusing on signal detection, its offline preprocessing and processing and subsequent analysis have been developed, but standardized implementation, real online deployment, testing and customization of BCI systems on target users have not achieved expected results. This BCI project thus focuses on using best practices for design and development of the BCI system itself and involves a large portion of testing and on-site deployment on individuals with motor disabilities in both hospitals and home environment. Within this project, the experiment design focuses mainly on the P300 component, but steady state visual evoked potentials, eye tracking and eye blinking detection have been also used as supporting interfaces. The data obtained from tested subjects have been collected, stored, maintained and secured following the current legislation. The obtained data have been annotated according to a promising standard and stored in our central repository, EEG Base. The experimental design of this BCI project, hardware and software infrastructure that was used, data collection procedure and storage, annotation and processing of data are in more detail presented in the following parts of the tutorial. Now, it is time for a short quiz. This course focuses on a. Highlighting the scientific value of EEG and ERP techniques b. Explaining the data lifecycle of EEG and ERP data c. Providing a detailed specification how to design and organize EEG and ERP experiments D. Giving a detailed description how to use machine learning methods in the EG domain. The right answer is B. Explaining the data lifecycle of EG and ERP data. What is the advantage of EG and ERP techniques? A. We can perfectly localize the source of electrical activity of the human brain. B. The recorded data can be easily interpreted. C. We get excellent timer resolution of the recorded signal comparing to imaging techniques. D. Noisy environment does not influence the quality of recorded data. The right answer is C. We get excellent time resolution of the recorded signal comparing to imaging techniques. How would you describe the importance of annotation and sharing of scientific data? A. Annotation and sharing of data is a time-consuming task that is not so much beneficial. B. Data should be well annotated, stored and shared to increase efficiency and effectiveness of scientific research. C. There is no sense to share data since finally nobody else understands them. D. Annotation and sharing of data is mainly dangerous since somebody else can interpret my data sooner than I can. The right answer is B. Data should be well annotated, stored and shared to increase efficiency and effectiveness of scientific research. What does the term FAIR data mean? A. Data are findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. B. Data were properly collected, informed consent was well written and ethics committee did a good job. C. Data are precisely anonymized. D. Data are given for sharing without any additional requirements. The right answer is A. Data are findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. What do we mean under the term EEG data lifecycle? A. It describes the procedure of collecting and storing EEG data on the hard drive. B. It covers various ways of EEG data analysis and includes all preprocessing and processing steps. C. 
It includes all procedures related to EEG data from experiment planning and design to data publication. D. It is a repetition of the collection or analysis procedure until all EEG data are collected or analyzed. The right answer is C. It includes all procedures related to EEG data from experiment planning and design to data publication.